Tom, how you doing, man? Doing great, Eric. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know you're a busy man. Some days. So many people have suggested that I talk to you. So I'm really excited to talk to you because you got so much going on. Uh, and I want to pick your brain on some things, especially the AG Cup. Okay. Uh, I'm ready to go, man. Let's talk about Armageddon Gear, your your company. That's that's. Uh, I want to know how that got started and how you get into, uh, you know, that business. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna have to back up a little bit, but I'll give you the give you the story. Um, I spent 22 years in the Army, most of that in the range of battalions. Um, had had a great career. Retired in 2009. Uh, did a little private security gig in Africa on the ships. Remember when the Somali pirate thing was a big deal, right? Uh, so right. got a little gig doing that. A buddy called said, Hey, what are you doing now? And I'm like, uh, hanging out on my farm, on my tractor every day. So I did that, made a little money, just did one little float. Uh, but while I did that, I'd sent Bushnell, the scope company, you're familiar with them, uh, a resume cause I heard they were hiring for a military sales guy. Uh, I met none of the requirements other than I had military experience, but they hired me anyway. And I built the, the tactical line for Bushnell. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, but some of your viewers will, some other ones, the, the pretty much the modern first focal plane, small rifle scopes that everyone are using, the uh, Bushnell HDMR was the first one. And uh, it was smaller, like, and it really put them on the map. They did some really great things with that. But I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I always wanted to do work for myself. And when I retired from the military, I'd been shooting a little bit of three gun. But when I went to work for Bushnell, I said, you know, uh, I'm doing this kind of stuff. I'm going to start shooting long range. And there was no PRS then. It was Sniper's Hide Cup. And th that was it pretty much. Uh, down at Rifles Only, first match, 2009, December with Jacob and Frank and that group shot a few of those and PRA started. And we all saw that it was, it was going to be something. And a few of us kind of got in front of it. I was working for Bushnell and I did the military sales. So Bushnell owned 13 brands at a time. Hoppy's number nine, uh, soft gear companies, Bolay eyewear, uh, of course, Rangers, uh, range finders, spotting scopes, uh, rifle scopes. So, Pretty much any military contracting officer that needed about anything, I had it in our product line. And I started getting a lot of calls for some goods. Well, the U.S. military government, there's a amendment called the Barry Amendment, which means that it has to be made in America with American materials. Um, and at that time, all the companies, small gear company stuff had been bought up by these big conglomerates. And you remember those days, Freedom Group, Vista. ATK bought up everybody and moved the manufacturing overseas. So there's hardly anybody making stuff in America. And I kept calling, kept calling, kept calling. I got the idea, man, maybe I could do my own company and do this. Bushnell got bought out. It was kind of a good time to leave. Uh, I resigned, had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, Tony Burke at Tad Gear helped me sell a first couple products, had 500 uh Carbine slings in my garage at home. Started a website, was selling them. Uh, some buddies of mine I used to serve with were working at Remington Defense. They got a small contract, wanted to put some slings with them. They contacted me. One thing led to another. They said, hey, can you make a gun case? I said, sure, I can. I had no idea. No idea how to make a gun case. Uh, I long story short is I drove to Tennessee, bought two sewing machines, put them in the back of my truck, drove home, hired a lady that worked at the gas station in our little town that said she could sew. <clears throat> we taught ourselves how to sew a few little products. <clears throat> and I had the right contacts and just started growing it. Then here we are. That's simple, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's simple. <laughs> Yeah, that and don't pay yourself for about four years and, you know, try to figure out how to work on sewing machines with tears in your eyes and, you know, all those stories. That's amazing that, that you able to take it from that to what it is now. Because, I mean, you guys do 
tons of business nowadays, correct? Yeah. Uh, we're, of course, the PRS world, we have a, a really good foothold there. We have a lot of customers in the competitors, not only just competitors, but just gun enthusiasts. And there's still a lot of guys that get together and shoot down the power lines on the weekends that'll probably never shoot a PRS match, just like we used to, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, every sniper rifle in the DOD, we've done the soft goods for, if it's been adopted since we've been in, pretty much all of them have been. We've done drag cases, gun cases, slings, suppressor covers for all those. Of course, our support bag business is good. And we have dealers all over the world. Uh, and do um, and do good bit of government sales too. Into a little bit of everything. We're uh, got an air rifle line coming out. I don't know how versed you are in the air rifle, the precharged pneumatic stuff. Man, it's growing fast. I'm excited about it. It's fun. It's a passionate group of guys in it. They connected uh, socially and they spend money on their sport. It's the perfect customer, and they're underserved. No one's making purpose built gear for these guys. So. That's a that's going to be a really good growth area for us, and uh, and we're expanding this year to do some more general outdoor products. I just ordered myself an air rifle when I was a shot show. I started to see them, look at them, and learn about them, and uh, I just had to get one. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm jumping into the air rifle myself. What did you get? I got the Air Force. Uh, they're they're from here in Texas. Yep, I got and, I got uh, a couple of them. So I got me one of them. I'm going to shoot some bench rest with it. Uh, yeah. At least that's the plan. It has a masterpiece arms chassis on it. It's pretty badass. Man, I'll tell you the fun thing about those is they are extremely accurate. They have no, you know, there's there's no harmonics to deal with. So they are just one hole, one hole, one hole with these good ones like you got. And, uh, and they absolutely have zero kick. Like for, somebody shoots it for the first time even at a hundred yard target and here's the ding on a piece of steel or sees the hole. And they're like, did something happen? Did it fire? Did it fire? It, it's just, it's addictive. And it's pennies a shot, pennies a shot. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my next, uh, next thing that I'm going to be playing with. Uh, so tell me about AG cup. H how does that get started? How does the idea even happen? Okay. Um, so, we were established brand in the PRS world, have been for several years now, but we never hosted a match. I've support uh, uh, tons of matches, put stuff on the prize table, but I've never been the title sponsor of a match. And I was constantly, man, you've never been a title sponsor. Well, let me a title sponsor for my match. And we do things a little different at, at Armageddon Gear. And you can see that you count on our social media. And I'm like, if I, if my name's on a match, it's got to be different. And I threw around ideas for a long time about what can you do different? And I decided, you know, and at, and at this time too, PRS had been around a long time. Uh, there wasn't much, it was growing, uh, probably not as fast as it's growing now, but it was growing, but it was, uh, it was at a point that it needed to grow more. And the top guys in it uh, were, hey, we're, I go to matches, I win them all, and I get another certificate off the prize table, and it just costs me a lot of money. I've reached the pinnacle, and I'm just not going to shoot much anymore. And we saw a lot of guys do that five, six years ago. And I thought, you know, for this sport to really take off, I think there needs to be something aspirational. I've been involved in shooting sports. Uh, my last job in the military – when I left the Ranger Battalions was to go to the Army Marksmanship Unit, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So the Army Marksmanship Unit, we had the Olympic shotgun, the Olympic air rifle, uh, international service rifle. And so been to Camp Perry, saw that, was shooting three guns, saw that. Uh, <clears throat> and had been exposed to all of it. The the service rifle stuff, it just kind of became an antiquated sport. The, the bench rest stuff, there's still a, a good following for that, but... It's not near what PRS is. And I was concerned as a business owner with my cart hitched to the precision rifle competition world. You know, what happens with this sport does like so many other shooting sports just starts petering out and there's not new growth, you know. Uh, so I thought, let's do something aspirational. I wanted to do it for the shooters. I also wanted to do it uh, selfishly to hopefully give the sport a boost. And I think it did. 
But the idea, I called John Scouting at Shooting USA. And I said, man, if I do this idea where we're bring the money in, it's a high stakes entry fee, pay to play, but 100% of the money goes back out. And if I can get some sponsors interested in doing it, can we give them some love by covering it on the event, have their banners up uh, and do all these kind of things. And all the money they put in goes to food uh, and paying all the way back out to the, to the, to the shooter. So the first year, and I'm not exactly sure, but I believe we gave out around fifty thousand dollars, which was a, is a lot of money uh, for a, a PRS match, frankly. Uh, but we did it different, with no sharing wind calls, not at the first year, not even watching anybody else shoot the lane. And as you know, a guy gets off in a normal PRS match. Guy gets off the stage and he tells his buddies or whoever on the stage, it's not cheating. It's totally within the rules. Man, the wind, I was holding a five mile an hour wind, or I was holding a 10 mile an hour wind, or I was holding a half in the left. That's a huge advantage if the guy that told you that is really good. If he's really bad and missed, then you've got really no help from that. So we alleviated that. Uh, there was no one's home range. Uh, we, we just did some things different with that. But the biggest part of it was the venue we used, everybody stayed together. We ate together. Uh, they shot together. They got to win money. Every stage was a thousand dollar check, whoever won it. Uh, the two-day event cut the field in half for the last day. The last day, overall winner got uh, twenty thousand dollars, and we actually took twenty thousand dollars cash and put it in the big AJ Cup trophy, which I'm sure you've seen. But uh, just wanted to do it different. Wanted it to be exciting. Wanted it to be fun. Wanted it to be aspirational, and we did it like that for two years. Then talked with uh, Shannon at the PRS. And he goes, what if we make this a series and you qualify to shoot your match instead of just being an invitational? And that would be good for the overall sport. It would garner participation at the lower levels, be good for the match directors around the country. And and those ma- I said, that's fine, but I want the payout to go back to the shooters in that also. Because money, cash is king, right? I mean, it's an expensive sport. If you want to do it, you got to buy the rifles, you got to buy the guns, you got to travel, you got to take time off work lodging food on the road so i think every year since we've done that we give away about 60 well not give away it's their money they're they're it's just going back to them about sixty thousand dollars a year just in the series and last year at the cup we gave away about eighty thousand dollars just at the ag cup championship so it's kind of a, a lot of money if if you're winning but even if you're not winning, you're winning, probably getting your money back. If you win one or two stages, you get a couple thousand bucks. So, and uh, we've got a lot of sponsors for it. That's that's really excited about it and thinks it's a uh, a worthwhile thing. And that's that's the life of it. If I don't have sponsors helping do it, we're not going to be able to have that kind of event and give that money back to those guys. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot about it, and and you're right. It I think it attracts shooters and it keeps them doing kind of a long-term goal, right? Rather than, you know, I'm going to go to this two-day match and hopefully I'll win it, right? And uh, yeah, I know you guys have the uh, the finale, but everybody that I've talked to about that, that, that does the AG Cup, they're super excited about it. They're, they're saying this is, this is the real deal. Well, it is. Uh, even the finale, it, it, the finale is a, is a big deal. I mean, going to the finale and shooting, I mean, it's, it, it's a big deal, but it's still 100 plus shooters. Uh, there's still a big variance of the skill level there. Um, and when you come to the AG Cup, it's small. Pretty much everybody there shoot on your left and right, you've seen on the podium. You know, Pretty much everybody there has a shot to win it, or at least take home some of the money that you're that's on the line for you. And it's it, it's it's gosh, the word just escaped me, but it's uh, it, it's it's informal, but it's very intimate. You know, it's it's a small group of guys, them and their family, usually them and their wife or something like that. A handful of sponsors that support the match, and it's small, it's intimate, and it's prestigious. Uh, it's covered. I mean, I, I wish I had the numbers, but uh, we have uh, the shooter's mindset on the ground covering it live. This year we had the ultimate ballistics guys doing real time scoring updates. And there are tens of thousands of people watching this, even from other countries watching the AG Cup go down live. Real time scoring updates that you can see from home on the on, on ultimate ballistics. 
and watch through the shooter's mindset the the, the guy shooting it with narration. I mean, it, it's it's a lot of fun. And then, of course, after the fact, on on the Outdoor Channel Shooting USA, with they do their episode on the AG Cup, highlighting the shooters, highlighting the event, showing the money payout. So it, I think it has achieved our goal. I think it has uh, encouraged some guys to train harder, join the series, which has helped the match directors across the country. And it's given the top shooters something else to strive for that can actually help your life. Uh, winning the finale is, is amazing. I mean, that's, that is, that's like, that's pride. That's ego. I got the golden bullet. Winning the AG cup, you could take home 30, 40, $50,000, you know, and that, that's, that's, that's a lot of cash for, for a guy that spends a lot of money to do this sport. And most of these guys are working. There. Yeah, that's, uh, that is indeed a lot of money. I mean, that's enough money that, uh, makes me want to go shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. You know, we did something similar in F class where, uh, you know, we don't have, it, we don't even have a finale in F class. You know, if you want to go like today, if you decided, you know what, I'm going to go shoot some F class and you decide that the, the F class nationals is the first match that you want to shoot at, you can literally show up and shoot the F class nationals. There's no invitation. There's no pre qualifiers. There's nothing. Uh, so we started something called the, the F class point series where we start tracking points and people have to earn points and then they get invited. So we invite 64 people, top 32 in F open, top 32 in FTR, and they go head to head. So we shoot because of, you know, we're shooting a thousand yards and there's always the, the, the luck of the relay, right? There's the target, you know, some, somebody gets a faster puller than the other and that's an advantage. So what we did is we eliminated all that. We put two shooters on the same target. They alternate, they pair fire. And they go head to head. They're only shooting against the guy that they're that they're competing against, and wh- and it's a double elimination format. So whoever loses twice, they're out. And but anyway, it goes over three days, and uh, you know we're able to pay back some money. The the winner gets about four grand. The second place gets two, and third place gets one. But pretty much, as long as you make make it past the first day, because the first day eight people get eliminated. But as long as you make it past the first day you're pretty much going to get your entry fee back and in f class there's zero money (laughs) like there's there's no money i just won the nationals and i'm not knocking on anybody but you know i'm I'm, money wise f class is not known to pay back and that's that's the that's a tradition right you don't shoot f class to make money so i just won the nationals and i got three (laughs) hundred dollars you know that's just (laughs) that's just how f class works so well, when we give back four grand plus prices, you know, our main sponsors are Vitavori and Vortex. They give out, you know, scopes and, and spotting scopes and bullet packages. I mean, they end up taking home about five to six grand for the winner, you know. And the the best thing is, like you said, any of those 32 can win it. There's no favorites there. Right. <laughs> and And because it's a different format, it's a pair fire format. It, it, anyway, it just makes it exciting and it's exciting to watch as well because you don't have to wait for the aggregate. You know, right now, when those guys are done shooting, there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser, you know? That's right. And anyway, it, it's, we're trying to uh, add some entertainment value to, uh, to F class as well as give the shooter some, uh, some way to earn some money. And, and it's, uh, it's becoming a pretty prestigious event because, uh, you, you know, you're shooting against the top just top tier guys, shooters, yep. you know, there's women there too. You know, I, I, I went out to the Utah air guns, uh, <clears throat> match out in Utah and watched the, the first time I was exposed to air guns and their, their match is, it's a culmination of maybe 10 different matches going on at the same time over the same weekend. And there's bench rest. There's, uh, a match like you talked, it's like a speed. It's basically a, a race to a knockdown plate, right? And it's head to head. And uh, then there's a little PRS style involved too. Then there's like a field fire. And then there's like a, 
a hunter class and you're shooting at animal targets with big boar. And at the end of it, you know, each one of those little individual uh, matches have their own little prizes and stuff. And, and it's, it's fun. And, and uh, I, I love the head to head stuff. It's, it's hard to do uh, with big rifles, probably even if resetting targets and things like that makes it difficult. But the first year at the AG cup, we had a couple cash side, side, uh, side matches we did for fun and it was the smallest participants, but we actually timed a Texas start 300 yards and whoever cleaned it the fastest. And of course we had to have people run out and reset and come back and it made it, but it was just, it was after the end of the day, let's do that. And then we timed a spinner who could spin it with, with the least amount of shots in the fastest time. And those were like $500 little side matches and stuff. But, you know, I've long had the idea. I mean, the AG cup was a good idea, but yeah, the shooting is basically a PRS style match. Uh, targets are a little harder. Um, the just the venue and the money on the line makes it uh, makes the guys uh, mentally challenged a little bit more. And as you know, any shooting sport, man, is a is a mental game, right? If you're in the right mindset, some days you're just like you're zen with the bullet, man. You're hitting, you're hitting. You just can't miss. Doesn't matter what the wind does. Doesn't matter. You're in your zone, and you're doing good. Um, so there are there are a lot of factors that do that, but the shooting is basically shooting a PRS match. And I've often thought how fun it would be to take PRS shooters, PRS rifles, and do a carnival type match where. You take a steel challenge course of fire from pistol and you put that out there from four to 600 yards. And it's just like pistol two on the left, two on the right and a stop plate for time. And that's the whole stage. You can do that at 500, 600 yards. You can do that at 300. You can have a, a, a bunch of little things like that where it's 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 about shooting accurately and fast, but it's a totally different target arrays. And it's all a race for time and 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 fun. And I think it'd be funner if we could pull a match like that where every stage is something like that. Yeah, that that does sound like a lot of fun. There's uh you know, my first PRS match was at rifles only, and we had to shoot pistols down there for a while. We had to shoot pistols and rifles. Yep. And, everybody uh, that everybody was quite that, fun. Everybody that's done this, it's funny you say that. My first PRS match was at rifles only, except it wasn't a PRS match. It was the Sniper's Hide Cup uh, before there was a PRS. But I think every all roads lead through rifles only in the long gun, you know, world. And uh, Jacob's still under rocking it and and bringing people into the fold and training our military shooters. And man, it's just what a great people Jacob and Lisa are. And uh, I'm honored to call those guys friends and have known them for a long time. And I need to get down there again. I mean, the last few years, I have not seen them, just talked to them on the phone occasionally, and, and I miss those guys, and that's kind of the roots. Well, not kind of. It is the roots of the sport, you know. When, you know, Jacob and Frank Galley starting those, you know, matches and bringing guys from all around, man, that's what professionalizes competitions. And we all tip the hat to those guys. Yeah, that you know, so imagine me as an F-class shooter, shooting my first PRS match ever at rifles only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a bit intimidating. <laughs> did, did you do the rat trap? It was a lot of fun. Yep. I had to do the rat trap. <laughs> and I was, I, when they told me what I had to do, I just stood there scratching my head for a bit and I go, well, what the hell? <laughs> it didn't go well, but it was, it was challenging. Like, you know, like I get to the top and, I, and you know, this is me not knowing, right? I'm like, when I get to the top, I, I'm going to have that rail. It's going to be easy. Hell no. It was, I was, I was out of breath. I was just shaking all, 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 all over the place. It was very unstable, but it was fun. Uh, looking back at the time it was stressful, which is the whole point, right? But looking back, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun doing that, that, uh, that trap. He, he does some uh, unique things there and he always has. And, and always will. Yeah, he had this, uh, I think he called it the oh shit stage. And you had two movers, a black one and a white one. And they were moving at different speeds. And uh, and you had to shoot them off a tank trap. <laughs> yeah. that's, oh, shit. You know, that's why he called the oh shit stage. <laughs> oh um, shit. And you had to, al you had to, you, ha you had to alternate, you know, left and right. You know, you had to shoot the white 
and then the black and white and black, but it was hit to move on. So anyway, it, somewhere, you know, if you weren't on it, 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 it became, oh shit, real fast. <laughs> Aptly named. And then he had the, uh, you know, from the tower, the iconic tower, uh, you had to shoot a thousand yards and he had like a, it was a troop line and the max you could get was 10 points or one shot at a thousand yards at a one MOI target. And then you either get a zero or a ten. Wow! And he just he would just he would just put that out there to see how many people would get suckered into it, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you know, uh, there's a lot of people that think they can just hit a one MOI target cold board at a thousand, and a lot of people can. However, when you when you realize that if you miss, now you just zero the stage. It makes you think twice. I'll tell you a funny story about the tower at Rifles Only and uh, the craziest thing I've ever done off that tower. Um, years ago, gosh, I don't remember. I had just gotten out of the Army, but Jacob called me and says, hey, Tom, uh, you're a fast stroke master, right? And I said, yeah, what well, well, was. I'm out of the military now. He goes, yeah, but you still know how to safely teach somebody how to go down a fast stroke. And I said, well, sure. Uh, and he goes, well, I need you to come down here to Rifles Only and let's fast rope. And I'm like, fast rope with who? He said, some some uh, magazine writers. I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, I had a fast rope. I have no idea where I got it, how I got it, but I had a fast rope. Uh, or somebody did. I, I don't remember. But uh, I go down there to get the fast rope, and it's a writer's event for a company that I'm not going to mention just because I still look back and say, why did we do this? I'm sure they all sign uh, liability waivers and stuff. But you've got magazine writers that aren't in any particular kind of shape. Some might have been, some weren't. Uh, some wearing cowboy boots, some wearing you know, tennis <laughs> shoes and, and different kind of gloves. And he's like, well, we're going to fast rope them out of the helicopter but we should start off with the tower so they actually built well i think that was my decision well, i want to put them off with a tower of some kind to make sure nobody kills himself well the top of that tower is pretty tall if you go to the top floor which mostly we shoot off the second floor and he just welded an arm sticking out of the side of the tower we hung the fast rip off of it and i thought these guys had a fast rip off of that and i'm like all right and we played around with the helicopter after that and I'm, I'm still looking back on that, like, God, what was I thinking? But then, you know, I was like, oh, I do, I do this every day. No big deal. But now that I have been out of a while, I'm like, God, that was dumb. We could have really <laughs> messed that up, <laughs> but we didn't. <laughs> Jacob's got this rule to this day that every time you move, you have to pull the mag right. every time. Yeah. And uh, so I, I learned how to shoot there. And then when I started going to some other matches, because I would time out at rifles only quite regularly. Well, then I start going to these other matches where I don't have to pull the mag. And all of a sudden, I'm so happy that he made me pull the mag because I'm not timing out. You right. know what I mean? It's just one less thing to do. So, you know, there was the silver lightning, silver lining there uh, for what Jacob made us do. Yep, that's, that's true. I shot a couple of his matches with a gas gun, and then you have to drop the mag and lock the bolt to the rear. So that, that adds another little set of time so but you need four hands to do it fast what's next for the ag cup is are you going to keep running it the way it's been running or are you going to implement some other changes well um i think as it's now established i think it's it's such an ingrained part of the prs that it will continue to be a qualifier through the ag cup series that's ran by the prs now, once it gets to the AG Cup Championships, I do have the autonomy to run it however I want. I can change the rules, but I think in fairness to the shooters, we follow the PRS rules and we do it the way they're used to it because that's how they qualified for it. But yes, um, this year, um, I'm in, and I can't say for sure, uh, but I was this morning and last week, I've been talking about it, the venue that we're going to do it at. But it is going to be uh, a little bit more like the first couple of years in that, uh, you know, last couple of years, Shannon with the PRS made it very easy for me because 
my biggest struggle was it. I'm not a match director. I don't have a range to run a match like that. So I had to find a place, go take all my targets, pay to rent the range, set the targets up for a three day match, uh, a very elite level three day match. And of course the banners and signage and food and all that stuff. And, and we're not set up. If you're a range, you're set up for that's a battle drill for you. Let's set up the match. Just get everything laid on. It was hard for me to do it off site. So, so Shannon made it very easy for me by saying, Hey, look, this is good for the PRS. I want you to be able to do it here at K and M and I will help you in any way. And the range is here. It's free. You can use it. That's not money out of the pocket. That's more money going back to the shooters. And, uh, and, but because of that, because he made it easy for me, I'm just like anybody, get a little lazy and let, let Shannon know, hey, set the match up, I'll come proof it, and we'll make changes. Uh, and I think just, you know, and it's been wonderful, with no, no doubt about it, it's been wonderful. But uh, I feel like it needs to move around, and that's going to put the work back on me. But it is going to stay in keeping with what the shooters are going to expect when they come to the AG Cup. It's going to be first class. It's it's going to it's going to feel have that intimate feel. We're going to have good food. We're going to have very, very challenging course of fire. The stress level is going to be through the roof and there's going to be a lot of money on the line. So, yes, if if I go chase one of those other ideas I was telling you about to do with long guns, it's probably going to be outside of the AG Cup venue. It'll be a different, newer event that gives me autonomy to to break the mold again. And, And I do have some ideas for that, but whether that comes this year or next year it remains to be seen so just so i understand uh you said the uh they pay extra money when they shoot matches how does that work like because there's an entry fee for the there's an entry fee for the ag cup right but there's additional money that they pay okay Uh, so when if you when you make it to the ag cup uh you pay a match fee for that cup which is percentage of it comes out to purchase food for them to eat and the rest of it goes right back to the shooters. Uh, and that's where we get the $30,000 pot and, you know, the stage money and all that stuff between the sponsors and that. But during the year, during the qualifiers, let's say there's a qualifying match. Uh, at, I'm trying to remember if there's one coming up uh, real soon, but it, it, there's already a two day match and then it's designated by the PRS as an AG cup qualifier. You pay on top of the entry fee to shoot that match. You pay your AG Cup entry fee. That goes in a separate pot, and it is shared back to those shooters that are shooting that particular match as AG Cup shooters. So they've all paid into this extra side pot where 100% of that turns around and goes back to those shooters. And there's a percentage of payout. So if there's 10 shooters that are shooting the AG Cup, you know, if it's 10, you're paying out four places. If it's, you know, 15, you pay out six places or, or whatever. I don't quote me on that, but something similar to that. So the guys can actually make some pretty real money through the series. If they target AG cup matches and they're shooting good. So just so I understand, uh, let's say they're shooting the, uh, some, you know, the loophole match here in Texas. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. A month ago. So let's say there's 10 shooters that are, that are going to do the, uh, ag qualifier how much do they pay in extra each i don't know because the prs runs that but i want to say it was okay. like it, i'm sorry i'm sorry let's that i don't have that answer two, i think it's that's like fine a, that's fine let's just come up let's just come up with a number 100 bucks okay so there's 10 people they each pay 100 dollars extra uh so that's a thousand dollar pot do they all get it back at that match uh, if it's 10 guys and let's say with that 10, the percentage, and again, that's all appears two years ago when we agreed on this, I knew those numbers. I just don't nail a lot of, a lot of my thumb drops full basically. And if I have to remember something new, I have to delete something. But if 10 guys shoot that AG cup, they put a thousand bucks in the pot, then it's going to get paid back out to the top three. That thousand is going to go to the top three. So it could go, you know, 500, 300, 200 for the top three or something like that. But again, that series, just those matches alone uh, paid out almost $60,000 last year. Okay. So none of that goes to the, to the actual AG cup at the end. No, it, it all gets, goes right back. Mm-hmm. So, okay. That makes sense. Now, what about 
the actual AG Cup? They how many people get invited to that? Well, when we made it a series, when when it first started, I invited twenty people, and then we cut to ten. Now, uh, in order to make it sustaining, because I had no intent to make this a every year do it, I was like, I'm going to do a great big match, and it's going to pad a lot of money and make it great. And now that it is part of the PRS series, um, of course, to make it sustainable with money and stuff, the more people, the better. So we agreed to invite the top 50. However, uh, just kind of the way it is now, if guys are top shooters, they feel like they have a, uh, you know, they feel like, hey, man, I'm good enough and I can afford the money. I think I'm going to win some back. They throw in throughout the year. And I think last year there were 60 some people that actually shot through the series to qualify. And although we said we're going to sh- invite the top 50, we'd love to have 100 and then be able to invite the top 50 just to make it a little bit more elite. But as it's growing, uh, we're like, we're going to invite the top 50, then cut it down to the top 15 after the first two days. Uh, but then a lot of guys, when they get towards the end, they're like, you know, I know I'm just not shooting well. I'm not peaking. And instead of going to go to the AG Cup, uh, I'm just going to cut my losses now and not have to take another weekend because I just know I'm I don't I'm not going to bring it. So I think last year I think 37 started out of the 60 or so that started shooting the series. We invite the top 50, 37 showed up to do it, and those are the guys that thought, "Yep, I'm I'm here to win it." You know, I'm here to I'm bringing it. So, um, you know, making it uh, not an invitational has been great for the organization and the sport, uh, but. In all honesty, it has made that match. I have heard from guys, it's like, you know, when it was an invitational, it was a little bit more uh, elitist, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yep, uh, it does. Well, I mean, it's going well from, again, I'm not even in the, in, uh, I'm not a PRS shooter. I, I do shoot some PRS every now and then just for fun, but uh, I am an outsider. However, I hear a lot about it, so that tells me it's doing well, you know, it, it is doing well. I mean, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I really do believe it's, it's, uh, it's, it's met the objective for the shooters and for the sport and for the sponsors. So, uh, I mean, I think it's here. It's part of the PRS in, in, in some way or fashion, the AG cup, uh, will become a sustained elite series within the PRS. And I just think that has to be because if it's not, every match is the same and there's, Nothing else out there. There's no way to win the money back. Whether, I mean, we've talked over the years and the guys know it, that that shoot it, that, you know, maybe it's the AG Cup in name, but another company wants to come in and be the title sponsor of that. And they want to take that, 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 you know, challenge on and that responsibility on to, to run it as the elite championship of the sport. Uh, and it's out of my hands. But until that time, I'll, I'll continue to run it and try to make it as good as I can. Well, you're doing a hell of a job. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work, but I, I do know that uh, the guys appreciate it, and I owe it to them to uh, to make it as good as it can be. And uh, I, I, I feel like everybody's happy overall with it. There's always going to be a winner, and there's always going to be a bunch of guys that looked at all that money and said, man, I wish I'd have got it, and I didn't. Uh, and that's the name of the game and that's why it is aspirational, you know? Yeah. Well, and you guys do a really good job on social media, promoting the, the AG cup and, and, uh, highlighting the winners and all the good stuff. So all that is, uh, is good. You know, the very first PRS shooter that I ever had on, on this podcast was Chad Heckler when he won the AG cup. Uh, I started seeing, you know, his picture pop up everywhere. And people were saying, you need to interview Chad. You need to interview Chad. And uh, I interviewed Chad. And since then, we've become really good friends, uh, him and Francis. Because, you know, uh, the 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 way the podcast works is once you're on, you get to nominate somebody else. Well, Chad nominated Francis. And after I talked to Francis, and, you know, and they just, so now I've had a lot of PRS shooters on because, because of that, right? But uh, it's, uh, again, that's kind of how I, <laughs> how I got Chad to be on just because he was everywhere. So again, you guys do a really good job at promoting the winners and promoting the AG cup. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the thing that, that keeps it going to is guys like Chad 
I mean, when you interview a guy like Chad, you, you get a read instantly of Ian Francis and, and so many more that I can think of that, that are, are professional guys. They, they apply themselves to a very hard discipline and, and try to master it. And, and occasionally you do. You, you have those times where you're like, I'm on, I'm, I'm on top right now. And, and they're well-spoken. They, they, they promote their sponsors. And it's just good for everybody. It's good for the sport. It's good for the new people entering the sport. It's good for the sponsors. It's good for your podcast. And uh, it, it's a great group of people. You know, uh, the shooting community in general is, is amazing. And, you know, my recent experience being PRS, man, you, you meet lifelong friends, you know, friendships that you'll cherish forever because you're, you're competing against one another while competing with yourself. And because everybody's competing with themselves, you're helping each other. And it, there's just a camaraderie that develops there. And it's, it, you know, so many times, you know, so many, so many stories I, I hear a new shooter shows up to an event and a guy like Chad Heckler, who is an AG Cup champion, says, hey, man, uh, you want to borrow my bag and let me show you how to use it because I think it'll really help you. And the guy just didn't know that there's a piece of gear that could help him on this stage and make him so much better. And now he got a lot more enjoyment out of sport. And he, he got to meet somebody that, that has a reputation like Chad, who is humble and helpful. And, and it, and it's not just Chad, it's everybody, you know, Francis, and I'm sure you've, you know, uh, talked to so many more guys like that. And those stories, never get old and they never stop happening, you know, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I'm proud that, you know, our company, you know, is in, is ingrained in this sport and these people, you know, the some of the most loyal customers uh, and just good people that are there for you and will do anything for you. And the, without that, no organization, no sport, nothing's going to survive, you know, and that's, that's truly a difference. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, these uh these uh shooters that I've had on, Chad, Francis, uh Austin, I mean, they are true professionals and they 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 really want to grow the sport. They they really they really love the sport. They they love the competition and but at the same time, they are willing to help anybody out. And I think that's what makes them true champions. It, well, it, it really is. I mean, you, you hear so often the term best of the best. I mean, that's a cliche and it's used over and over again. And, you know, competing at a high level may make you the best, but what makes you really the best of the best is having all those, you know, character traits that we just talked about and those attributes and that humility to be able to, to help each other's out, have a, have a sincere desire to grow the sport and help their sponsors and, and, and those guys, honestly, they, they drive the industry, too. I mean, um, you know, making a new product for me or anybody, there's, there's investment in time, there's investment in labor, there's investment in materials to come up with a product that you hope pays you back one day. And uh, th- these guys constantly are like, hey, man, I've got an idea and I would like you to make it. And I think it would be great. And, and you listen to the idea and... And I have made so many products like that, that, I mean, let's face it, you only have so many great ideas, you know, and when, when you run out of ideas and guys are coming up saying, what about this? What about that? We did a product uh, a couple of years ago, we released it. It's called the tripod caddy. And there's really nothing been marketed like that ever before. And I was at a match in Ohio and Francis had, a fanny pack wrapped around his tripod legs snapped together. So there was a little pouch hanging between his legs. And then he had a, a little bitty backpack up on the top and it was all strapped in and he's standing there behind his spotting scope and he just digs in pockets and grabs some stuff. And I'm like, I remember I was sitting on the ground, he's standing up. That's why he's a champion and I'm not, I'm sitting on the ground, just waiting to shoot. And he's up like going through everything and reading wins. And, and I'm like, that's a really good idea, Francis, the way you've got all that set up. He goes, yeah, it's everything's at hand and I don't, I'm not constantly digging and I'm always in my scope and I can see down range and it just, it's a huge time saver and allows me to stay focused and my gear's more organized. 
And I'm like, I think I could do that a lot better than, you know, tying stuff to your tripod legs. And I, t- he showed me everything he had in there and the things he wanted close at hand. I made a couple of prototypes, sent them to me. He was totally, you know, just open with me and said, hey, this is how I think how it should go. It should do this. It should be this. And we made changes based on his input. And then we launched a product in, uh, in 2021. It was the, uh, have you heard of, uh, Oh my gosh! Um, uh, it, it basically it won the uh, innovative product of the year for the Industry Choice Awards for the firearms industry, and that's not that's not that's not gear. That's it's guns and scopes and uh, binoculars and everything. And it uh, it it was the Frank DeSoma Innovative Product of the Year Award for 2021. Uh, as voted by the industry masters, which is just a group of people voting that whether they're shooters or uh, magazine writers or ROs or anybody involved in the sport, we send them these, they test, they look at them, they play with them. And, and that was an idea that came from Chad who just freely handed me that idea and said, here you go, man, you know, I, this, need, this is my idea. And if you can make it better, do it. And, and it's been a great product for us. And, and I, and, you know, I know those guys, Chad and Francis, particularly, you know, they're, they're, they shoot Leopold scopes and they're sponsored by them. And I know they give them a lot of feedback and help them grow their products. And these shooters, the best guys in the sport uh, are the guys that are, that are driving the industry when it comes to shooting better. And these products that these great shooters are, are driving through their sponsors and through their companies that they shoot for, it winds up in the hands of the military and then the military adopt these training tactics, these techniques that these guys are using, the gear they're using, because if a piece of gear, you know, our flagship product is the game changer bag. And if that makes you a better shooter in a competition, it also makes you a better shooter as a sniper. It also makes you a better shooter as a hunter. It also makes you a better shooter as just a, a weekend guy getting together with your friends. And in, and these things are built out of necessity. And I would argue that with years and years of snipers training, the, the innovation in long range shooting from Vietnam to 2010 was very minor. And then when PRS started and the sport of shooting started, the innovation just in that last decade, decade plus, is is through the roof. We are so much better than we ever were. A thousand yards was the holy grail, you know, 15 years ago. Oh, I, I shot a thousand yards. No one can believe it. Now a mile, two miles, you know, what, where does it stop? The, the ammo's better. The bullets are better. The, the guns are better. The barrels are better. The optics are better. The skill level, the, the way these guys apply themselves and train, they're so much better. They're so much more knowledgeable. Our ballistic software is better. Everything, I mean, who knows where it's going to stop, but the things we can do now with the rifles versus 10 years ago is amazing. And versus 20 years ago is light years of advancement in a few decades. And, and some of it's as simple as a, a shape of a bag to shoot off of a support is the simplest idea, but if it wasn't a need and guys weren't forced to shoot off rocks, you know, and weird shaped things, those bags would never came about. Uh, it's crazy how good these guys are. Yeah. It's quite impressive. Like I said, I've shot some PRS matches and I've seen some of the pros and they are so efficient. They're so good and they set up so fast, you know, and, Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Brousseau, uh, when I first started, I reached out to him and he's like, just learn how to shoot with a bag. And I'm like, what about tripods? And I just, just learn how to shoot with a bag. And <laughs> he, he, man, he could just put his rifle on that bag and just, just go to town and just destroy every target out there. It was amazing to watch. So yeah, bags are definitely, uh, a game changer. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is, man. I mean, that one thing I can tell you this, um, uh, there's a stage at K&M that is in every match and it's the rocks. And a lot of matches have the rocks, you know, or something similar. So basically it's five odd shaped rocks and two shots from each. Uh, it could be the same target or it could be a different target each. That's really not the point. But years ago on that 10 round stage off the rocks, fairly easy target. 
you're running up there with some odd shaped bag you're trying to make work and it's got the f- or you're just laying the gun on it or you're putting your bipods down against the rocks and leaning into it and loading it up or hooking the back of the rock and pulling back or any little thing and you're just basically trying to break the shot on the wobble right i mean you're you're just trying to oh i'm wobbling around the target break it right you know and and I remember coming off the stage like that going, holy cow, I got six. I got six out of ten. What? I've had a great run. And now it's because that bag, you're so stable. It's like, dang, I dropped one. How did I drop one? I was so stable. I, I don't know what I did. You know? And it's it's just it's changed everything, you know, it. And that's a, that's a, and that's just one little I mean, that's the most non-technological advancement made, but it still had a huge, you know, just a a huge impact. But then when you start talking about, you know, bullets and cartridges and barrels and the quality of the products we got now, man, it's, it's amazing. And, and of course the software, I mean, like, I mean, 13 year old girls pulling out their Kestrel with the ballistic software going, Hey, you know, at a thousand yards, you've got a, you know, a seven and a half mil drop and, you know, and it's in a a 0.7 left wind. And and if you can get stable, that's probably good data, you know, and you're hitting the target. Whereas 10 years ago, we're going back through old range cards, trying to match the DA to an old range card to what the DA is today. And, (laughs) and it's just, well, you remember. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you know, you talk about the bag as being so essential uh, Chad, Chad came and hung out with me for a day and he told me that he carries this bag with him on the plane because if he loses that bag, like he, <laughs> he could almost afford to lose everything else, but <laughs> just not that bag. And yeah. I thought he was exaggerating a little bit, but he wasn't, you know, no. it's, it's that critical, man. I, I have, so the, the most, the, the most popular bag in the sport is the, the Schmedium game changer bag. All right. So the original game changer bag was made of Cordura, like like almost all shooting accessories are made out of Cordura. Cordura is a nylon product and it's it's bulletproof. It'll last forever, but, but it's hard and it's slippery and it doesn't have the softness. By accident, we made a shooting bag out of wax canvas. I had a little bit of this old cotton duck wax canvas stuff that I just thought looked cool. And I thought, I want to make one of those just to hunt with because it looks more hunting, you know, the old school hunting stuff. And I made one and it's sitting on the coffee table in the Armageddon Gear lobby. And Brandon Hembry, who is a top shooter, uh, shoots AG Cup every year. And at this time was probably on top of the game, uh, winning a lot of matches. And he's standing there and he's talking to me and he just kind of absentmindedly picks it up and is fondling in his hands while he's talking he stops in mid-sentence and he looks at what's in his hand and he goes what is this and he's squeezing it and i'm like it's a game changer i made out of this wax canvas and he's squeezing it and he's feeling immediately he feels the tackiness of the bag and he feels how soft it is and and i know his mind's going how's the gun will settle in the bag instead of just laying on top of the bag and he goes this is going with me and i said all right man take it (laughs) And he calls me a few days later. It's like, oh, my God, dude, this is sick. And I'm like, he goes, man, don't make these. Don't make these. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, now I got to, man. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and then it went from a poly bead feel to sand. Is, sand is the greatest shooting medium. It's dense. And we used super fine pure silica sand. But when you put that in the original Game Changer design, it was just so heavy. It was a little difficult. So he made a small bag called a pint size. A lot of guys loved it, but it was a little too small. So we made it in between called the Schmedium, fill it with the heavy sand, and it's about right. And that's by far the most popular bag in the sport. And again, it went from this bag has changed everything, changing the material, made it that much better, changing the field, made it much better. And again, man, it's we're talking about cloth and sand. Not a big deal. But when these guys, one of these bags, because the wax canvas is not a super durable material. You're throwing it on rocks. You're throwing it on fence posts. You're throwing a 20-pound gun on it. It's going to wear out. 
And I got some of these top shooters. They'll send this bag that looks like it's been run over with a, a, a bush hog. And some of them even have. And it's like, can you fix it? I'm like, man, I'll just send you another one. No, no, that's my bag. I can't. I can't use a different one. That's my, I said, dude, I'll make it exactly the same. So <clears throat> I started getting ahead of these guys because they would these bags would be just so worn out, and they just wouldn't give it up. And so, you know, I would I would encourage these guys and some of some of my sponsored shooters. I would just send them another bag and say, man, start breaking this in. At least start training with it. So when your other bag wears out, you've got a backup, and it's not going to be the end of the world, you know, for you. So. But man, you are not kidding. You are not kidding. No, they, they, like I said, Chad was like, this goes on the plane with me because I, I can, I can, I just can't lose this bag. It, it's his lucky bag, his, his everything bag. But anyway, it's, it's, it's fun. And it's, uh, hey, you know, just like we talked about being a mental game. If you believe it works, then it works. That's it. That's exactly right. It is exactly right. And that bag is a, is, is a great example of that. Well, and it's also like, man, I, you know, uh, guys running the barrel till it, it's like, man, this is the best barrel I ever have. And in their mind, once they change that barrel, <laughs> you know, their whole world goes yeah. to crap. And if they think that they can't, I, I have a funny story from uh, about that. Uh, when I was the sergeant major of the Army Marksmanship Unit, you know, we have the service rifle team. And just like every shooter, man, those guys are in their heads constantly about their gear, about everything. And uh, we have a gunsmith shop that does all the work. And one of our best shooters there, he was on top of the game, setting every record, breaking records in service rifle. And, you know, he had a bad day training or something. And immediately he brings his rifle down to the uh, gunsmith shop and says, this, this barrel is no good. It's no good. I have to have another barrel. I have to have another barrel. Well, the gunsmith is uh, he's been called the father of the black gun uh, at the time was Gene Clark, who uh, basically accurized the first AR, made it, you know, just just made the service rifles what they are now. And he takes it apart, takes the barrel off the rifle, looks at it, and I'm down there, it's like, oh, you got to give him a new barrel. I heard him. He's like, no. Nope. He said, I'm going to clean it. I'm going to decopper it. Uh, I'm going to make it look like it's a new barrel. I'm going to put it back on his gun, and he'll be happy. And I'm like, what? And so now I'm interested, you know. <laughs> so now i got to see this story through. So a couple of days later, when the service rifle team comes to draw their guns, I go over there to watch him train. And I'm watching this particular shooter, and he comes off the line. He is like, man, I'm so glad I traded out that barrel. He goes, this one is a hammer. That other one was no good at all because he got it in his head. And I guarantee you he would have shot like crap if he didn't think he had a new barrel. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. so funny. A lot of that just goes on. And, and uh, again, but if you believe it works, then it works. You know, in F-Class, we do so much. Don Nagel, uh, he was asked one time about his breast prep for competition. And he said that he did 20 steps to his breast. And they're like, 20 steps? And he goes, yes. He goes, and I know I don't need to do 20. He goes, I think all I need is 10. The problem is I don't know which 10. <laughs> so, so I do all 20. But, yeah, it's it's all – a lot of it is here. And, uh, hey, if, if if you need it to win, then just go ahead. If it keeps – if it's working, just keep using it. Don't deviate. Yeah. But it's a interesting conversation always. Um, well, Tom, this has been amazing, man. I appreciate you uh, making some time for us for doing this. Well, thank you, man. I'm glad you had me on, and um, I appreciate it. So now it's nomination time. Who do you think I should talk to? Who do you think I should have on? I have two people, it, but and you can choose because I can't. Um, of course, uh, Ben Gossett, the winner of the AG Cup this past year, and not only the winner, a clean the last day of the AG Cup. Right. Didn't miss a shot. Right. And if you you had to be there to actually appreciate the feeling in the air as he's shooting those last few stages. You could have not heard a pin drop. And it was so amazing. And he was overcome with emotion at the end because he did something that no one thought would ever happen. So now we've got to up the ante next year, right? But uh and he's a wonderful guy, great family man, just the salt of the earth. And I know you'd love talking to him. The other 
is Justin Jacobson at Utah Air Guns. And that man is single-handedly driving the future of that PCP, pre-charged pneumatic sport, and innovating in the, uh, in the development of new rifles. And basically, he's driving the air rifle sport to uh, adopt a PRS format to attract new people, and he's driving the major players in the pre-charged pneumatic manufacturing to to make the rifles for that and they are and just to gauge he's the right guy to gauge how explosive i think this this sport is going to be and how involved it's going to be in the in the years that we'll see very soon uh it's a lot of excitement about that believe it or not and we're we're powder burners they call us but uh, when you when you get a bunch of guys together that are that passionate about something, uh, man, they're going to find they're going to copy. They're, they're going to model. They're going to model the, the PRS organization. They're already the PRS 22 now has an air rifle category as of this year. And, and you're going to see a lot more involvement in that. And uh, that's exciting to me, too. But he's just a super, super smart guy. And he knows his business and he knows that market. He knows everything there is to know about it, and it's just interesting to talk to him about it. Good, yeah. All right, I'll I'll get in, got a hold of Justin because Ben already, uh, he's going to be on. He already committed to be on. So okay, good. I'll I'll call Justin. Yep. All right, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, keep on uh, keep on doing what you're doing, man. You're doing a really good thing for the sport. Thanks, Eric.